Everyone's heard of Persona, right? That RPG series that everyone praises whenever they get the chance to. But is this praise justified? Yes, without question, it is undoubtedly a wonderful and unique experience that no other game offers, but sadly, we're not here to just talk about the video game. We're here to talk about the new adaptation, Persona 4 The Golden Animation. Oh, uh, but Glenn, how will this be any different from the original Persona 4 anime that aired in 2012? Well, Persona 4 The Golden Animation is going to basically be a retelling of the original story, with the new character Marie being introduced, and even though this is essentially a remake, that doesn't mean that it can't be substantially different. The studio and staff have completely changed from the original series. A1 Pictures will be the ones at the helm of this project, and seeing as they are a much more distinguished animation studio, I have faith that they can easily improve on a lot of the issues that I had with the original. I mean, it's not like a completely different studio would hire the same director, right? I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they did. They hired Seiji Kishi again. <laughs> Again, why did they do it again? We could have stopped this. Why does this happen to everything I love? <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Emotional breakdowns aside, they decided to hire the same director as before. And it's not like he's someone renowned for creating terrible game adaptations, right? Oh, wait, he is. This is the guy who made the awful game adaptations of Devil Survivor 2, Danganronpa, and obviously the original Persona 4. As much as it disappoints me that he's returned as director, I can still be optimistic. Maybe he's learned from his mistakes and will make this the Persona adaptation that I desire. Or not. His track record isn't exactly the best. The main issue that I have with his adaptations is that he attempts to stay as faithful as possible to the source material, which isn't a problem in itself, but transferring aspects from one medium to another doesn't tend to fare well, because guess what? Video games are completely different than TV series, and endeavoring to keep everything the exact same results in a disorganized mess. When doing a video game adaptation, you MUST change things and play around with it, which Seiji hasn't done even once. I'm absolutely still looking forward to it because I positively love Persona, but it's extremely difficult to keep myself from not being skeptical. The best way for me to describe the first season of Space Dandy is that it's a show that's looking for its identity. It doesn't know what it wants to be, so it tries an assortment of different things in an attempt to fabricate an identity for itself. And while it strives to do this, it manages to be one of the most unusual experiences I've ever had with an anime. And I still find myself constantly questioning whether or not I actually like Space Dandy. Revolving around a space adventurer named Dandy, you follow his travels through space and witness the bizarre situations he places himself in. I have very mixed feelings, because it's fun, eccentric, and wacky, but I just feel so unsatisfied by it. I want it to be so much more than it is because the potential it has is apparent. It's faulted by its own efforts to be different and loses any type of consistency. But if it's anything, it's entertaining, and watching it take on new, innovative ideas is a spectacle in itself that effortlessly made it worth watching. All in all, Space Dandy's journey to find itself constructed one of the most uncommon stories I've ever encountered, and I can't wait to see what identity it finally forges for itself in the second season. Wait, 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 wait. The second season of Free, it's here? Right now? Yes! Yes, 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 yes! Woo! I love dudes without shirts! I fucking love them. I'm gonna go tell my mom about this. Nah, but seriously, Free, the show about a swimming club and their internal struggle of keeping their clothes on. No, but seriously, Free, my favorite show about men getting wet. I mean, uh, in a in a swimming pool. Nah, I could I could go on all day with these dumb jokes, but for realsies this time. Free, one of the most self-aware shows that I can think of. It knows exactly what it is and never gives up on what it is, and I revere it highly for that. Despite its pandering, Free still easily manages to have a lighthearted and mature story about what the love of a sport can accomplish. I've run dry on jokes at this point, so I'll just say this: Free is fantastic, and you should watch it. And for the record, my mommy's pretty hyped too. The Fate franchise, known for its gripping narrative, immersive world, clever writing, and magical girls? Uh, I mean, it's been like a year since I've last played the visual novel, but I don't remember magical girls. I mean, uh, but who cares? Would you have a spin-off to the sensational Fate franchise that embraces lolly magical girls with Yuri undertones subtly incorporated in? I didn't really realize how outrageous that sounds until I said it out loud. But who cares? Fate Collide is fantastic. Fate Collide tells a fast-paced and consistently entertaining show. It's fully aware of how silly it is and cracks inherent jokes about it. It still manages to naturally shift its tone to a more serious, mature atmosphere when it wants to, and it's honestly just fun, a blast of a show that you can fully engage in the comedy with. It's also a delicious appetizer for the Fate Stay Night remake coming in fall. 
I really adore the concept of being trapped in a video game world. It's not original and it's been done numerous times before, but there's never been one that's executed the concept correctly. I'm always hopeful that the next one will be the one to do it right, but Sora Online definitely wasn't the one to do it. I still find myself enjoying it despite its multiple flaws, it's objectively terrible, but as long as I can still manage to enjoy it, I can forgive it. I've also been told on more than one occasion that the later arcs in the Light novels are significantly better, so I decided to read them and well, they're definitely an improvement, but at the same time previous themes and characters are sacrificed for that slight improvement. Well, at least for Gungale Online. If this was an adaptation of the Mother's Rosario arc, this would be a whole nother story. But alas, it's only Gungale Online, which doesn't particularly spark any sort of exhilaration from me. At least Gungale Online is considerably better than the Alpine arc in almost every aspect, but the only real reason I'm looking forward to it is because the most memorable scenes from this arc of the novels are the fight scenes. The intensity I felt from just mere words on paper forced me to engrave these fierce action sequences into my mind, pushing the abilities of my imagination to create the phenomenal scenario playing out. I cannot wait to see them animated, but that's honestly the only thing I'm looking forward to from this arc. Regardless, I already know what I'm buying a ticket for, and I'll gladly take this train wherever it's going and enjoy it for what it is. I was very skeptical when an anime adaptation of a Kamiya Kill was announced, but my doubts were immediately annihilated when it was reported that White Fox would be the ones taking on the task of this adaptation. White Fox is the obscure studio that many have regarded highly for their splendid adaptations of Steins Gate and Katanagatari, both fantastic shows that were puppets to the puppeteers that were White Fox. I'm still at the edge of uncertainty since the director doesn't really have many notable works to reflect on how well he'll do on this but my hopes are still high because the source material is very well received for its divergent story, which is about a fighter named Tatsumi who ends up joining a group of assassins that are rebelling against a corrupt government. That sounds rather generic, but it does have a hidden dark tone that lays in silence while it lays the trap of a fake lighthearted story. I absolutely adore gore, and a comic kill has that with a compelling story to boot. This is definitely one to be excited for. Monogatari is a series about embracing your own demons, and through doing so, acknowledging and accepting the consequences of your own personality. This is a trial that every single character endures throughout the course of the show, and can bruise up to bat again. She's going to have to face down her personal demons. She'll be unable to deny the monster in her heart any longer, and when it's unleashed, it's going to bring a tidal wave of emotion with it that can destroy her very being. Sadly, I have to be as vague as possible because I don't want to spoil anything, but this is one of my personal favorite arcs in the novels, and I'm just so overwhelmed by happiness that it's been animated, yes! I can't wait to experience Kanbaru crushing these delusions known as demons, fighting the labyrinth of her own selfish feelings. Will she fully exterminate her demons or utterly surrender to her inner reality, causing her to become the living representation of the demons she's trying to expel? I can't give you these answers, but Hano Monogatari can. Everyone has dreams, everyone aspires to be something, and I love watching the attainment of said dreams through the trials that keep those dreams locked away, which is what Glasslip appears to be all about, achieving your dream and making the most of your life. It follows around six students and our protagonist Rukami as she works towards her dream of being a glass artisan. The main reason that I'm so excited for Glasslip though is the fact that it's being made by one of my favorite studios, PA Works. Oh, how I love them. Every show that they've produced, every piece of fiction they've brought life to, it has influenced my outlook on life, my perception of my own self even. It's absolutely remarkable how much emotion their series have evoked out of me, whether it be Tari Tari, Nagi no Asakira, or the flower that blossomed that day. I've never felt more passionate and sentimental than when experiencing one of their superb series. PA Works has very rarely failed me because of the confidence that every show they produced evidently flaunts around. This confidence arises from their consistent, well-written, beautiful stories that stay focused on the themes that it sets. Okay, maybe I'm going a bit too far with the praise, but every PA Works production has always had excellent direction and glass slip won't be exempt from that rule. Expectations can make or break a show, and Odd Noah Zero is the current show that's being hyped like no other. It's not as though the hype is unjustified, but having too high of expectations can easily cause huge disappointment. But I guess it's difficult to not be enthusiastic about it when so many big names are attached to it. First off, we have Gen Urobuchi for the original story, known for Badoka Magica, Psycho Pass, and Fate Zero. Speaking of Fate Zero, the director, a uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, a Ayaki, I'm so sorry, will be returning to hold the reins of yet another Urobuchi show. Then there's... 
Hiroyuki Sawada handling the music, known for his work on Kill a Kill, Attack on Titan, and Guilty Crown. Ah, oh, this list just goes on and on and on, but who cares about those dudes when Takayama Katsuhiko was also on board? This is the guy who did script work for Boku no Pico, and now he's doing the series composition for Odd Noah Zero. Get hype! Sodas for life! But seriously, it's effortlessly intrigued my interest with all of those big names working on the project, but I can't really tell what to make of it yet. It's about a war between humans and Martians after the discovery of a hypergate to Mars, which is definitely appealing, but sounds a tad bit cliche. Regardless, I can't help but look forward to it, but I feel like all of the expectations that are being placed on it will be detrimental to people's enjoyment of it. The real world's a scary place. Not because it's brimming with monsters, it's scary because it's full of other people. Because it's full of risks, setbacks, and harsh truths. Acknowledging this in a story is a very difficult thing to do. But Zonkyo no Terra appears to illustrate this wonderful yet cruel world we live in to the last horrifying detail. Every evil and every good. Focusing on two young men that orchestrated an enormous terrorist bombing, but what motivated them to do something so insane? Perhaps we'll delve into the character's reasoning and psyche to get an understanding of what motivates such atrocities, especially if it's done in a realistic manner, but tackling the real world isn't a task that many can accomplish with ease in creating a reflection of the world that we actually live in. Thankfully, we have a distinguished director taking on this task, Watanabe, known for his other famous works such as Samurai Champloo and Cowboy Bebop. So he obviously has the talent and ability to fabricate a story we have yet to fully experience such as this, and I have the utmost faith that he will succeed in creating another instant classic that goes by the name Zonkyo no Terror. Hey guys, Glenn here, and if you want to watch most of the anime that I talked about in this video, you can watch on Crunchyroll. There's a two-week free trial down below in the description, and maybe go like me on the Facebooks if you like me. No need to be Sunjane about it. Baka, I don't want to like you on the Facebook. Also, my top ten for spring should be done within a week or so. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys next time.